Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Welcome to Labor Vision. My name is Tom Carr. I'm your host today. Uh, with us today for the segment is our Secretary of State, Nellie Gobert. And I think I can safely say that she is probably uh, working for us every day, tirelessly protecting our electoral processes. And we thank her very much for that. And today we're uh, going to be discussing voter registration. Uh, welcome to the show today, and uh, thank you very much for everything that you do for us. You know, we've done a lot of really great stuff over the last three and a half years. I'm very excited and proud to go back to the voters. Um, you know, a lot of what I talk about, um, I also say that I'm very proud that it's the entire team at the Department of State that has helped me achieve all these great accomplishments. And uh, many of those are union members of uh, the laborers. And so, you know, I, I, I talk about all the different products that we've been able to produce on time, on schedule, and with state dollars, with state employees that are union members. And well, it's, it's really great. Well, thanks for giving them the shout out. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, now, we're here today to talk about voter registration. Um, can you tell us why it's so important to be registered right now um, for the primary and not just for the general election? Oh, no, absolutely. I think because every vote matters. In this particular primary, there's some very contested races uh, all from all the way through the ticket, from local council, school committee races, all the way up to state general officers. Uh, I'm one of the more fortunate ones. I don't have one, but um, I will have you know, uh, an, op an opponent in the general election. Uh, but yeah, a lot of times people tend to think like you know, primaries don't matter. In fact, for me, my first go around, the primary was the really, really tough election. And uh, if it hadn't been for all those people who said to me, wow, congratulations, I voted for you, but I didn't think you were going to win. You know, a lot of people think that their vote doesn't really matter, but it does, because voting is kind of like that very solitary act. It's just you and your ballot. And you think, oh, I have so many other things to do. Um, do I really need to go? It's a primary. Who cares? And uh, no, it's hugely important. It's that collective force of all those votes that changes history. Uh, agreed. I, I don't think people realize that sometimes primaries are the election here in Rhode Island because the, the Democratic Party is more important than yeah. sometimes. It, but, 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 in, but in this case, we actually have primaries on the Republican side, too. True, true so, enough. So I would say, I would venture to say no for both parties. True. Um, this is going to be a heated primary day. And what's interesting about this particular primary day, it's that it's on a Wednesday. Oh, good it's point. It's September 12th. And you know what? That sets up my next question. Mm -hmm. um, let's give um, voters an idea of mm -hmm. the important dates they need to know sure. this year. Yeah, no, absolutely. So the primary is going to be September 12th, which is a Wednesday. And we did that because uh, the Tuesday that it would have been, uh, fell on one of the Jewish holidays. And Correct. so to accommodate religious observances, we did it on, uh, we have it on a Wednesday, September 12th. The deadline to register to vote in Rhode Island is 30 days before the election. Okay. This is in the Constitution, so it takes a little bit more than just a bill to change it, because I know people say to me, well, why haven't you changed that? Well, we're getting there. <laughs> but uh, we have to do a lot of other things first. And so it's 30-day blackout on the voter lists for the okay. most part. So you have to have been registered by August 13th okay. in order to vote on September 12th. All right, so that is the day to be registered for the primary. That's right, as a new registered voter. If, you are, if you're moving within those 30 days, okay. within Rhode Island, right. call my office because we can walk you through. It's a calculation about whether you vote in your new okay. town or your old town or within the town, what polling location. So but if you, you're a you new can, registering, you registering for the first time, okay. you have to do it before 30 days. So switches and things like that can be done. Are a little bit more complicated. I wouldn't okay. leave it for the last minute. Right. 
Okay, all right, fantastic. That's good to, to, good to know. Same thing with a general 30 yep. days 30 in advance. 30 days also, which would okay. be October 8th okay. for the November 6th general election. All right, fantastic, thank you. And okay, so, and what is the best way for people to register to vote? So there's no one best way. You know, it's like, you know, <laughs> what's the best flavor of ice cream? Uh, you know, we have a number of ways right now in Rhode Island. Yes, we, historically people were, we will remember filling out a form, finding a stamp, nah. sending it, mailing it in, or, or going to city or town hall. We've moved way beyond that. Right now, you can actually register to vote online, but you can only register for the first time online if you already have a driver's license. And the reason here being that we need okay. your signature oh. in the system somewhere. You can't just, from a terminal, register yourself to vote okay. without a signature. So, so you can most easily change your address online. That's the easiest thing that you can do with online voter registration. Okay. Um, and then just a few months ago, we started automated voter registration at the DMV. So anybody who's changing their driver's license address or registering there uh, will be automated. There's, the process has been automated. So rather than have to jump through a lot of hoops to register to vote, we know that you're a US citizen. We know if you know what your date of birth is. We know what your address is you'll get a screen that says, we're now gonna register you to vote. If you don't want to be registered, then you can opt out. And so that change alone, uh, in the first week we saw an 82% increase in voter registrations. And uh, then the second week we saw an increase of 102%. Why, you would ask? Because people sometimes they're like, oh, I don't wanna do yet another form. I don't wanna do this new process. They're at the DMV, they've waited long enough or for whatever reason, they, they've got other issues that they want to deal with. And so this now lifts that burden from them and says, we will automate this process so that you don't have to worry about it. I think now that you mentioned, I think my, my youngest son mm -hmm. actually, the first time he renewed his license, mm -hmm. was given the option to automatically register to vote, now that you say that. So but when would have this been? Five or so years ago. Oh no, that was that was a, still the, the old process. This this automated process has only been in place for the last couple of months. Oh really? Yes. Oh. What we had before was we did have an electronic registration, so you could you could okay. when you got your driver's license, but you still had to maybe he did fill out a separate then. form. And that may, uh, no, not five no. years ago, but that's okay. But you can do that now. The DMV does have has had for the last ten years mm -hmm. electronic transmissions of voter registrations. Okay. So that's what you're we're probably thinking because it was a keypad that you answered some more questions and then it would but you always it always asks you do you want to register to vote? Yeah. And that would be very confusing for people who were either already registered and they were just changing an address or yeah. you know. So we've simplified the whole process so that you know people can go on with their lives. We're trying to make government work for people. Yeah. You don't want to create a whole other process. If if you already know that they're a citizen, you know that their, uh, their, dry, their um, address and you know the, their date of birth, let's go ahead and automate that process for them so you don't have to think about it. See, me, I moved two years ago. I go down to the, Canva, the Board of Canvas's mm -hmm. office and I sign Very the paper. Old I, right, right. Very I, old and that's why I know my son did something online. I mean, I, I uh -huh. know that yeah. for a fact. Yeah. I just, so, he's more technical than I am. <laughs> that, that might be the case. You know, as of today, we've seen a total of 11,000. Uh, 496 transactions through this automated process. Wow. Many of them uh, are changes of addresses. They're not all new registrations, right. but it just speaks to, it's now easy. So we have more accurate voter rolls. Wow, so well, okay, well that sets up my next question. So, so far this year, how, um, how has voter registration been? Have you seen increases in the, over the past year or? Are things yeah, staying you, same? Definitely, or? because of because of the automated voter registration, you've definitely seen increases. Uh, but now the trick is that's only the first step. I mean, when, once we do that, now we have to make sure that people come out and vote. Okay, all right, and, and that yeah. that's another thing. I mean, do you think what uh, that's sort of my next question? Do you think there's anything driving this? Do you think it's just the automation? Do you think there's any issue behind people coming out to register to vote or? Yeah, no, we've seen a lot of energy, particularly around young people, wanting to register their friends and make sure that they know about how to go about registering to vote. So I absolutely believe that this election um, really has a lot of energy, also from uh, some of the women groups 
uh, mm -hmm. have asked for trainings from our office as to how to do that. Um, and, and the candidates themselves, of course, are always good. Yeah. So, uh, but, but it's so much easier now because you can go to vote dot ri dot gov. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people can't even remember if they're not a frequent voter, if they've been registered or not, mm -hmm. and so you can just check it on your phone. You're with your, you know, neighbor, and you're having a conversation, and you're and they can't remember whether or not they registered or where they're registered. Then you can just go to vote dot ri dot gov and just look them up right there and then. We have people when we when we're out there on election day. We yeah. a lot of us are out, out there. Of, VoteRI.gov, checking things, uh, uh, yeah. checking to see if people are mm -hmm. actually Reg registered on that day. But so. the trick is to do it before August 13th, oh, yes. when people can yeah. fix it. Yes. Or if they're not registered, they can register. Yes, absolutely. So, um, and what would you tell anyone that's on the fence about registering to vote? Oh, you have to do it. You absolutely <laughs> have to do it. No being on the fence. Um, you know, I get that elections are complicated. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of times people don't vote because, you know, they just have a lot of other things on their mind. And, you know, democracy in the U.S. is not easy. I mean, I come from Puerto Rico originally, and in Puerto Rico it's a very different electoral system. It's once every four years. You don't have these special elections in between for the most part, uh, or every two years. It's also, you know, a party kind of vote for the most part. There's a big drive to do it by party. We do that a lot here, but, but there's a lot more candidate analysis here as well. When you move from Providence to Woonsocket, you change the entire bottom part of your ballot. Yep. And if you've got kids, you've got a job, you've got a mortgage, you've got a rent, you've got all these other issues, who sits down with you and says, oh, by the way, you now moved and uh, you've changed your ballot and you need to now learn this new system of government at your local level. So what I'm trying to do as Secretary of State is to make sure that early on our kids have this knowledge instilled in them. And so we've prepared a lot of teacher resources that can be taken up by teachers in the schools to help teach civics and help them realize that every community has its own form of government. And, and ask questions like, are you, do you have a town manager or an elected mayor? Or is it a city council appointed mayor? So all of those questions, it's, it's important to be an educated and informed voter and going to the Secretary of State's website, we've tried to provide as much information to make that easy. Okay, now that, you bring up a good point there. Do you think that we teach kids enough early on about the process of voting that they're interested enough by the time they're 18 to actually go to the voting booth? I think historically it's been hit or miss. Okay. Uh, partly because we have a lot of demands already mm -hmm. on teachers in a very short uh, time period, and so this is not, you know, this is a sort of a communal responsibility. I don't think it's anybody's fault necessarily. Agreed. But, so what I've tried to do is to provide easy access to resources online that the teachers can use or homeschooling parents can use to have these conversations around civics and government. Um, and, and, and the other thing that I've done is I've offered all high schools in the state, private, public, parochial, everybody, uh, the opportunity to do their student government elections on real ballots with real voting machines. Uh. So it's one thing to say, oh yeah, here we have a mock election and you're gonna go vote for president. Well, you know that you can't vote for president. I mean, teenagers, they're very, you know, very um, uh, susceptible to, to not wanting to participate in mock fake right. events. So, but this is different. This is your classmates. You're choosing, you know somebody's gonna be happy. You know somebody's gonna be upset the ballot should feel different. And you do it on a real ballot, and you put it into the real voting machine, we got the results really quickly. We've done it in over a dozen high schools at this point. And the idea is to instill that relationship with voting and with the ballot. So they are taking advantage of it? Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So they are seeing real-time results, real-time. Right. Uh, consequences. Ah, uh, so. Elections of consequences. So, okay, so maybe, maybe they're actually watching TV now and seeing that elections have consequences. <laughs> yes, yes, they Ho definitely have had hopefully, consequences. Hopefully, hopefully they are seeing that, they are learning that, yeah. and they will get out to the ballot box and, you know, learn that their vote has a consequence and they need to get out and actually vote themselves. And, and, and young people in Rhode Island actually have the opportunity to pre-register to vote and also be poll workers. So right. I want to put a real plug in there. If you have a 16 or 17 year old that's going to be out of school for whatever reason that day, um, on, on election day, I think the schools are definitely closed on primary day, it depends mm -hmm. on the school. But um, have them work as a poll worker. 
uh, as a greeter. It's a real education in how democracy works. And I know a lot of communities are always looking for young people. So uh, 16 or 17 year olds, US citizens, can pre-register, they have to be 18 to actually vote, but they can be pre-registered and just look at this process up close. All right, well, thank you very much. This has been very informative, and it's been a great talk about getting people to register to vote, and we need to do, do more of it. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching Labor Vision. Good evening, and welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Jim Riley. I'll be your host tonight. Tonight, we have a very, very timely show on an issue that's of importance to everyone in Rhode Island. It's been on the front page of the paper every day for the last four or five days. I'm talking about the, the hospital strike in Providence and uh, two members of the executive board of the Union of Nurses and Allied Professionals, all part of the Lifespan family, Norman Farias and Tracy Galloway, who work at Rhode Island Hospital and Hasbro Children's Hospital. Well, everyone knows, if you're from Rhode Island, what's going on, but maybe a lot of them don't really know the inside story of what's happening, how, what, what, what brought this about, and uh, give, us, give us an update of what's going around now. We're, we're, we're uh, taping here on uh, Thursday uh, morning, and uh, where are we right now? What's happening? Well, we've been on strike for three days. Um, we actually wanted to go back to work today at three o'clock, uh, but the hospital has actually chosen to lock us out for a day. Okay. So that's why we're not back to work until three o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, we got here because we've been trying to force a, a culture of uh, an atmosphere of respect and uh, staffing so we take care of our patients. Um, and it also involves retaining nurses and uh, the compensation has not been there to retain uh, our nurses. And so the starting wage at Rhode Island Hospital is the same as it was um, 10 years ago for a nurse. And we need to change that culture. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that in a healthcare environment, like most environments, you don't want to completely keep retraining people. So if you reward the people properly with, a, with a, a competitive salary and benefits package, you're more likely to retain people and not have to keep dealing with retraining. Correct. No. Yeah, well this has been our point and you know, so for the veteran nurses that are there, they're constantly retraining nurses and uh, there's a statistic, I believe it's 30% 30, 30 30 of the nurses that are hired leave within two years. So you have a lot of veteran nurses training, doing orientation. The minute they get done, somebody leaves, you get to start all over again. And that's not fair to the people that have been there. And obviously that should be a signal to the hospital that we're not doing something right. Mm -hmm. People are using it as a stepping stone and it should be a landing yeah. place. Oh, right. that's and, interesting. And that's, yeah. that's really what's been happening. They go to Boston or they go mm -hmm. even to another hospital in the area that pays uh, two or three more dollars an hour. And for somebody young out of school, mm -hmm. they have student loans or somebody who like myself came into it later in life, you have other obligations and the hospital's missing that. Right. Tracy, yes. tell, us, tell us what's going on. Oh, I feel the same. It's the retention and the <coughs> lack of resources that we have that we can't keep these nurses here. Um, so we have a lot of new nurses that are coming in, getting great training so they can go anywhere they want, but they realize when they're there, they don't have the resources or the support they need to continue their journey on in the hospital, so they'll go elsewhere to get that. I've, I've heard a lot that a big issue in some healthcare institutions, mm -hmm. not in all of them, is uh, low staffing. And I understand that that has been one of the big issues here that drove you folks out. Yeah, we, um, we have a ton of short staffing forms that have been filled out. I know the hospital keeps mentioning that we've never talked about it during negotiations, but it has come up. It was one of the first things that we brought up back in April, um, and we tried to get a float pool for the um, emergency department on the adult side because they're always running short and they're pulling so much overtime over there. Um, they didn't see that was a need for it. Um, so we've always talked about in this the retention because if you're losing all these nurses, then where where are the other nurses that are going to be helping you on the floor? So we're always short staffed. As, I suppose it's probably important to note that you're not making widgets over there or hockey sticks. Correct. You are caring for sick people, and in your case, God bless you, sick children. And mm -hmm. staffing certainly should be uh, uh, something taken care of. 
Yeah, and, and it's the same thing for every time a new nurse comes in, we're very excited. We do our best to try to keep them excited and keep them engaged. Mm -hmm. But pretty soon they see that the working conditions aren't such that it's a place that you want to keep working. And particularly for the lack of resources, the hospital pretty much plays it close to the vest, and they always have. So for instance, um, in one of the buildings at night in the bridge building, you might have just one secretary. So see, first of all, before I go any further, I have to talk about it's This is so much more no, right than, than nurses, go okay? Ahead. And I think some of some of it gets lost. You know, we have, we have technicians, we have OR techs, we have x-ray techs, we With have mental respiratory health. therapists, mental health workers. Mental health workers, some of the lowest paid, you know, for a baccalaureate degree and do some of the hardest work, mm -hmm. you know? So it's really, our union is made up of a, a diverse background and we, we always want to make sure that we mention, you know, everyone because, yeah. you know, it's so important. Um, and these short staffing forms, we've been putting them in for years. Yeah. Uh, we have an initiative, a Patient Safety Act at the legislature that we try to get passed every year and the hospital comes down with all their big guns all the time to fight this initiative because they say that we're part of that. It's a collaborative about patient and staffing, right. uh, but it's really not because if it was, we wouldn't be putting in so many uh, short staffing forms. So all these short staffing forms, which are basically you're telling uh, management, look, we have a problem here, we've got to do this. <clears throat> Correct. And the management at the hospital is not responding to this in a hospital, in a professional way. I find that totally and completely absurd. <laughs> Well, what they, what they usually do is they'll say that uh, they've looked at the situation and they don't seem, they don't think that it's unsafe. Right. You know? Or they'll actually call the nurse into the office who put the short staffing form in and want her to explain it, which is um, a little bit lopsided when you're thinking that you're already short staffing, now you're being taken off the floor to go and explain it to a supervisor why you're short staffed. And incidentally, the supervisor doesn't spend all their time on the floor no. caregiving to patients. No. Yeah. So, no. you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, like a contradictory situation right. uh, where you just, you know, leave us alone and give us some more help because we're... Tracy, we're oh, I feel the same thing. Yeah, they usually, like, they'll give you an email. <clears throat> That's usually how they answer the short staffing forms is they'll answer in an email saying that, well, you were able to get the job done safely, so then you weren't really short-staffed. Mm -hmm. That's their answer yeah. to it. Yeah, or overworked. Or, right. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's our goal, is to make sure that we get everything done safely. So we will work short-staffed, but we get our job done safely because we're caring for the patients and we don't want any harm to come to them. So they don't mind as long as the car doesn't go over the cliff. It can run right up to the end, right. but as long as it doesn't go over the cliff, it's okay. Correct. Yeah, and that's well put. <laughs> and, and we also have our Teamster brothers and sisters that are there at the hospital. You know, that's the other big union that's at the hospital. Right. And those are secretaries and UAs, and they do a great job, and they, yeah. they've been very supportive of us, and we support them. Uh, but when they when their staffing is affected, it has a, a uh, trickle-down effect. Yeah. Because so if, you're, if you only have one secretary in a building at night, and you, especially Tracy who works in an intensive care unit, mm -hmm. uh, you're answering the phone, or you're trying to track down if, uh, equipment that somebody else is supposed to be doing, and this takes away from your care to the patients. Let's talk about resources. We talked about staffing. All right. Um, I actually heard a story that there are some, some nurses who actually hoard supplies in the emergency room, so they'll they'll be on hand when they need them. IV uh, IV pumps, IV pumps, That's and things huge. like that. You know, I found that really hard to believe, but apparently it's a reality. It is a reality. Good lord. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you know, this this reminds me of the teacher that goes out and spends like so many teachers go out and spend five, six thousand dollars on their own supplies to get them. Mm -hmm. They're teaching kids. We've got six sick kids here. Mm -hmm. We've got sick patients here. We've got people coming into the emergency room yeah. that have been hurt and need really, really good care right away, stat. Right. And, and that kind of thing is going on. What is the problem with this administration and resources? That close to the vest in a hospital? Right. Inexcusable. Tell me about it. Well, you know, I, I just think that they have, uh, they've lost touch a little bit. Oh, I shouldn't say a little bit, a lot, uh, you know, with their employees, you know, and they don't, 
they, they don't really give us a voice. So, you know, we have the Aleva Management Forum where we get together once a month and we go in and, you know, we try to talk about the problems, but most of these problems don't get fixed and they don't get addressed. And they, they, don't, they don't really listen to us and we're the front line. You know, we're the ones who take care of these patients. We're the ones who deal with the families. And in Tracy's situation, it's all family because you're having, you know, babies and stuff right. like that. And they just don't seem to, you know, they have an idea of how the hospital is supposed to run on paper. Right. And that's what they go by. Right. And they don't listen to us when we tell them there's some problems here that need to be fixed and they don't listen to us. Right, they spent all this money on this program called OpX, um, who's supposed to keep track of what we use, what we don't use, but when some days we're running short even on bed linen, so you can't even put a fitted sheet on a bed, so you have to kind of makeshift your own bed because um, they contractually only give you out so much linen and stuff. Crazy. It sounds like we've got a lot of terrific people working there trying to do a great job. And it seems like we've got a lot of people there that aren't spending enough time on the floor and aren't listening to you folks who right. do the great work and to give, give the care at the bedside and uh, all the ancillary work that's involved in running a, a hospital. Right. Is there too much administration? Is there too much management? Are there too many people at the top that don't understand what's going on? And maybe if there wasn't, you could get rid of a couple of million dollar salaries and be able to afford to buy the, uh, to have uh, plenty of IV pumps in your uh, uh, emergency room supplies closet? Where are we? Well, what is you this? know, I, I mean, I'm a nurse. I didn't go to CEO school or, uh, you know, yeah. I don't have an MBA, um, you know. Uh, evidently, they think that those people are, you know, doing what they're supposed to do. But we really just see a lot of bodies walking around, but not helping us. Um, we have ACMs on the floors. Uh, they are supposed to be the assistant managers to the managers, but they don't take care of patients. They just kind of watch what you're doing. Uh, even in the evening, you could be the charge nurse, and you still have responsibilities. Right. You have to take care of patients, but you also have to, you know, answer patient complaints and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And they don't have any of these um, managers working the off shifts. So evidently, only stuff happens during the day, and oh, nothing happens in the evening or at night, right. yeah. because right. you, they don't have any, you don't see right. them, and that, that's an issue. And you know, is there too many of them? You know, I, I can't speak if there's too many of them, but are they being utilized correctly? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, the bigger, the hi higher up people don't really walk around the floor as much at all. So like you're talking about Timothy Babineau, uh, Bob O'Reilly, Margaret Van Bree, we don't really see them much. So they're the ones who are the ones that decide what gets, mm -hmm. what goes where, so. Okay, so where are we right now? What's the situation? I know we've got about 10 busloads of scabs that come in every day. By the way, this sign right here, I made that sign, I'm very proud of it. <laughs> I like that. It says, these <clears throat> scabs can't heal. Yeah. Um, I was there actually yesterday morning and saw all those trucks come in with those folks that come. I don't know what sewers they find these people in. All right. But uh, where are we right now? What's happening? Give me about 30 seconds to wrap up. What's going on? Well, so we're, we're trying to get back to work, but we can't today. Okay. And uh, tomorrow there'll be a transition at 3 o'clock. The replacement workers will come out, uh, will go in, and v Dr. Van Bree said there'll be a cooling down period before uh, we can get back to negotiations. Uh, I can't speak for the entire executive board, but I know for myself, I would prefer to get back to the board, right I mean, away. yet to the, you know, to the negotiating table right away. You guys are looking forward to get into that facility and to take care of your patients. The scabs are looking forward to getting their paycheck and go and go take the place of some other workers. We wish you well. We're proud of what you're doing and uh, hope everything works out real well for you. And that's it for this edition of Labor Vision. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week. Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.